If you're like me, you have traditions in your family. Growing up, we had a number of traditions, and one of them was a traditional place we used to go camping every summer. It's a place called Priest Lake, Idaho. Anyone ever heard of Priest Lake before? Okay, several people. You see, in Idaho, they actually have lakes. In California, we have a lot of reservoirs, but not too many lakes, if you know the difference. Reservoir man-made, a lake, has just been there, uh, God-made, we might call it. It's gorgeous up there in Idaho. The lake itself, the main portion is 19 miles long. It has beautiful mountains, beautiful trees. Sometimes moose will swim across the lake. Sometimes deer will swim onto the island. It's an amazing place. And we would go there every summer and we would camp on Kalispell Island, one of the several islands on the lake. Big enough to camp on. It's, it's I don't know, a mile around or, or it's actually probably more than that. And in any case, you have sandy beaches, you have places for picnic tables to put your tents in the woods. It is the most fun. And if you're into wakeboarding or water skiing in the morning, you wake up and the lake is just flat and calm. You push the, the boat off of the beach and you're ready to go. And it's, it's just an awesome place to be. So I have a lot of memories from Priest Lake. Well, this particular memory is actually from my dad because I wasn't born yet. But a long time ago, when my dad was there, he was about 10 years old, they uh, went to bed, as they did at nighttime, and during the night, the boat, which had been anchored to some degree, as Tristan spoke about, somehow slipped free from its anchor. It was either anchored or it was pulled up onto the shore, and a little bit of a breeze kicked up in the nighttime. And gradually and imperceptibly, that ski boat started to drift. All through the night, the wind blew. And in the morning when they woke up, there was no boat. No boat to be seen anywhere. Remember, the lake is 19 miles long. Big lake, small boat. This is not a good situation. So my grandpa got out his binoculars and he started just scanning the horizon, looking, 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 looking. And after about a half hour, he finally saw something down towards Kulin, the town of Kulin at the end of the lake, that he thought might be the boat. It was about the right color, but he couldn't really tell the shape. And so they get in another boat, and they start to drive, and they go five miles down the lake, and there's their boat, a borrowed boat. Harley, the man who had borrowed the boat, had borrowed it, I think, from his boss. Here's the boat getting closer to the end of the lake and the rocks. It was drifting all night long without them realizing it and was going to smash on the rocks. But praise God, they were able to rescue it just before that happened. Drifting is so dangerous because it's so imperceptible. I love that story. You're fishing, you think you're in the middle of the lake, and then after a while you realize you're back at the shore again because drifting can happen without you even noticing that it's going on. I remember when I was a kid I saw this video about this dad and his kids in this, in this boat. They were fishing on this river on the border of Canada and America and the engine wasn't starting. It wasn't starting. And the kids are getting nervous. The dad, no, I'm going to get it started. I need it started. Well, eventually, their boat drifted over Niagara Falls. I think they survived uh, in my recollection, which is uh, a miracle in itself. But drifting can have dangerous and deadly consequences. So the sermon title this morning, More Dangerous Than the Devil, the idea is... A lot of times we think about the devil's attacks as this open, visible thing that you have to resist, this moment of temptation. But more subtle than that is drifting, which actually the devil is involved in also. So I want us to open up our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 2, and we'll start in verse 1. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 1. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 1. 
we find here that the Apostle writes these words. Well, in fact, what's the first word in, in your verse, in your translation? Therefore, what would you say? We, okay, yeah, we. Um, somewhere in your verse, there'll be a word like therefore, or since, or seeing, or because, for this reason. And, and you guys have heard this before, but when you see a therefore, you have to ask, what's it there for? Right? So we need to go back, actually, before we read the verse, we need to look at what chapter 1 is talking about. What's the essence of chapter 1? And we won't read all of chapter 1 right now, but just in brief, chapter 1 is all about Jesus and his supremacy over all the angels, over all created beings. Jesus is not a created being. He's been around forever. Chapter 1, verse 2, it says, God has spoken to us in these last days by His Son, whom He has appointed heir of all things, through whom He may also made all the worlds. Jesus made everything. He's heir of all things. He's above all things. And then you look and you scan verses 3-14 through 14, and you see that Jesus was set above all things. He was declared in this heavenly moment above all things and above all angels. Verse 3 says that he sat down at the right hand of the highest seat of power. It also says that he made purification for our sins. Verses 5 through 6 remind us that Jesus is the Son of God and he's worshipped by the angels. Verses 8 through 12 highlight the fact that Jesus is the eternal ruler over everything that he created. Verse 13, Jesus is waiting for all of his enemies to be made under his feet, to be made subject to him. So basically, chapter 1 is saying Jesus is awesome, he's the best, he made everything, and he's above all things. Therefore, because of who Jesus is, notice what we see. We must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest, here in the New King James Version, lest we do what? Lest we drift away. Because of who Jesus is, because he's not messing around when he speaks, because he spoke you into existence, we have to pay close attention to what we have heard, the gospel that was preached to them, lest we drift away. Verse 2, for if the word that was spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him? Because of who Jesus is, and because the angels, when they talk about judgment, aren't messing around either. How could we escape a similar judgment if we neglect, if we drift from what we have heard? Drifting's so easy. Have you ever been to a, a water park where they have those lazy rivers? Yeah, you'll love those. You just get in an inner tube and you float. And because they have current that's man-made, you don't lose any elevation. You just go around and around and around as long as you want to. Right, Jaden? Yeah, it's fun. Drifting is so easy, but the Apostle here says, if we drift in our faith away from what we've heard, it will be to our eternal peril. He's saying, wake up or watch out. There's a waterfall. It may be a lazy river right now, but there's a waterfall and you won't survive if you drift over the falls. Watch out. Every year in Yosemite, it seems like, we have people who go over waterfalls. There are signs posted. I've been to a number of those falls. Signs saying, don't swim here. It looks like a beautiful place to swim above Vernal Falls. You can't swim there. Well, you can, but you can do it at the risk of your life. And every year, because the rocks are so slippery, people don't sense their danger. People go over those falls every couple years. The Apostle says, we must give more earnest heed to the things that we've heard. In other words, the things that you've been reading in your devotions, apply them in your life. The things that you hear in Sabbath school, follow them. What you hear being preached, 
put it into practice. What you hear on the radio as you're driving along and you're listening to a preacher or to a, a Christian song or something, put it in your life. The spiritual book devotional that you've been reading, those counsels written to us by Ellen White, apply them in your life. The things that you've heard, what you hear at your Bible study during the week or at prayer meeting, apply it. Wake up. Watch out. Don't drift away. Don't forget what's going on. Because if the angels are right about their punishment for sin, how can we escape if we neglect salvation? Wake up. Watch out. There's an interesting example in Scripture to us of drifting. A guy by the name of Demas. It's only mentioned three times. But he makes an interesting case study when it comes to starting with God and then drifting away from God. Turn to the book of Philemon. Philemon. If you're in Hebrews, just make a left and turn about two pages and you're in Philemon. Demas, we don't know a lot about him. He sounds like he was a Greek, or at least partly Greek by his name. It was a common Greek name. He probably well, very possibly was a convert, maybe even a convert of the teaching of the Apostle Paul. But notice what we see here in Philemon. This book was written between 59 and 63 AD or something like that. Philemon, there's only one chapter, so we just look at verse 23 and 24. He had some notable standing because he's mentioned by Paul. Not everybody who was a believer was mentioned. Only a select few. So, so Demas apparently is a young guy who is passionate and he's working alongside of Paul. Verse 23 says, Epiphras, Ephras, my fellow prisoner in Jesus Christ, greet you, as do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, Luke, my fellow what? <coughs> Laborers. And that's in the plural. So Paul is saying Demas is a part of this group who are laboring alongside of me. Wouldn't that be awesome? To be a fellow laborer with the Apostle Paul. That's like getting called by Mark Finley or by uh, C.D. Brooks or by one of the great evangelists in our church saying, hey, we're doing some meetings and I want your help. I want you to tour with me and work right alongside of me. Be on my evangelistic team. Demas was a part of that group. And he's apparently doing well with it. Otherwise, Paul would never have called him a fellow laborer. He would have just called him a tag-along, a wannabe, or something like that. But then we find another verse that mentions Demas. Like I said, there are only three. Two more to go here. Book of Colossians. And again, you just keep heading left in your Bible. And we're going to pass up all the books with T's in it. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. You can remember the order of those books by the phrase, Go Eat Popcorn, or GE Power Company. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Helps to have little memory tricks, at least for me. Colossians, chapter 4, verse 14. Now, we're not exactly sure exactly when Colossians was sent, but some have suggested it was sent at the same time as Philemon. Others have said it could have been sent a little bit after the time of Philemon. Don't know exactly, but perhaps it was sent a little bit after. But we find again a reference here to Demas. Colossians chapter 4, verse 14. Notice what the Bible says there. Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. It doesn't seem like anything out of the ordinary here, but I want to back up to verse 6. Notice how every single name is going to have some sort of commentary about them. Look at verse 6. Actually, verse 7. Tychicus, a beloved brother, faithful minister, and fellow servant in the Lord, will tell you the news about me. He gets... Three wonderful things said about him. I'm sending him, verse 8, to him for you to know this very, 
for this very purpose, that he may know your circumstances and comfort your hearts. With Onesimus, and what's he said? What's said about him? A faithful and beloved brother who is one of you. Again, very positive things to say about him. They will make known to you all the things which are happening here. Verse 10, Aristarchus. He's Paul's fellow prisoner who greets you. With Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, about whom you received instructions. If he comes, welcome him. Everybody so far, something positive, something to say about him. And Jesus, who is called Justice, these are my only fellow workers for the kingdom of God who are of the circumcision. They have proved to be a comfort to me. Yeah? Why does it say Jesus who is called Justice? That's a good question. He said, why does it say Jesus who is called Justice? Jesus was a common name uh, in those days. So... Uh, they, they gave him another name, who they also call him Justice, maybe because he, there was another Jesus that was, they didn't want to confuse him with, possibly. Good question. So, and then we get to verse 12. Epaphras, who is one of you, a bondservant of Christ, greets you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. Epaphras, he's a good guy. He's always laboring, and he's always praying. Verse 13, for I bear him witness that he has great zeal for you and those who are at Laodicea and those who are in Hierapolis. You getting the picture now? Everybody has something, Paul has something good or something else to say about him. And then we get to verse 14, Luke, well, he's the beloved physician. We love him. And then we see, and Demas greet you. And I don't want to make more out of this than perhaps needs to be made, but you almost wonder if there's something that's starting to go on in the relationship. Paul said something about everybody else, but Demas, he's just Demas. And he sends his greetings. So we don't know for sure if something has happened in their relationship, but for sure by the time we get to his final reference in 2 Timothy things have taken a tragic turn for the worse. So we go to 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. Paul here is in house, house arrest, and he's there in Rome. And he senses that things are about done for him. Demas had been working alongside of him. He was a young evangelist, a young Bible worker, a young, a young uh, health force worker, Joseph. <laughs> right? But now we see very clearly, if not before, that the situation has drastically changed. 2 Timothy 4, 4 verse 9, Be diligent to come to me quickly, for Demas has what? Forsaken me having loved this present world. Greek word there for present is the word noon, which means now, the world of the now. He loved this world now too much, and so he forsook Paul, departed for Thessalonica, Crescens for Galatia, Titus for Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Paul now is feeling alone. Only the beloved Dr. Luke is with him. And Demas, who had started off so good, had drifted away from the ministry and from faith altogether. Nobody starts Christianity and says to themselves as they're passionate for God, I think I'll drift away. I think I'll turn to the pleasures of the world. I think I'll turn away from God. Nobody in a good marriage relationship wakes up one day and says, I love my marriage, I love my spouse, I'm going to have an affair. Right? It doesn't happen in a healthy dynamic like that. It only happens because of gradual drift, generally speaking. So Demas has been traveling with Paul. He's been going through the different cities. He's seen Paul's passionate appeals to people. But in those cities, Demas has been noticing, in my mind's eye, he's been seeing the other things that are going on in each of those cities. 
While Paul's been preaching, Demas has been hearing the, the people in the marketplace and he's been seeing the various sights and there's a part of his heart that's longing to be out there instead of in here. And so there in Rome, Paul's in house imprisonment and Demas is there and Paul is writing these letters and he's praying and he's talking to people and Demas in my imagination is sitting at the window and he's looking out the window He's physically present, but his heart is not in it anymore. It's so easy for us to come to church and to, to go through the motions, but have this thought in our hearts, I wonder what it's like out there. I wonder what that would be like. Or not even thinking those thoughts, just drifting away from our passion with God. And Demas, we have no other reference points for his life. Demas appears to be a lost soul. He wanted to go out and explore the world and we have no record of him ever wanting to come back. Drifting doesn't happen all at once, it happens little by little. There's a song written uh, similarly about this topic it says it's a slow thing when we give ourselves away slow thing when these changes happen in our lives I've had some close friends and family members leave God entirely it didn't happen all at once it's happened slowly so the apostle reminds us in Hebrews pay a close attention to the things that you've heard lest you drift away because there's reality in our world there's reality spiritually and one day we will all see Christ some of us will say that's our God I'm waiting for him and others will say where are the rocks that I can hide underneath we gotta wake up we'll watch out and this is all in contrast in 2 Timothy to verses 6 through 8. Look at this. Paul is saying, For I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, and I have, the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good of fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Paul's saying, I didn't drift. I kept pushing forward towards the goal. Finally, verse 8, There is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not only me, but also all who have loved his appearing. And then verse 9 and 10, and by the way, Demas has drifted away. Hmm. It's a sad story. But that doesn't have to be our story, amen? amen? We don't have to drift away. So what are the warning signs of drifting? Well, in simple, it's a, it's a decreasing desire to spend time in God's Word. Decreasing desire to spend time praying. A decreasing desire to be with God's people. Ah, I don't want to go to church today. Ah, I don't want to go to Bible study. Ah, I'll do that next week, next month. Ah, I don't want to hang out with those church people. Decreasing desire to pray. Decreasing desire to study the Bible. Decreasing desire to be with God's people. And, and a, Decreasing desire to share the good news with others. Eh, that glow stuff, that's for Anita. That's not for me. Lots of ways to share, amen? But whatever God has called you in how to share the gospel, if you have less of a desire to share Jesus with others than you have before, you're drifting. And the Apostle says in Hebrews chapter 2, we got to pay closer attention. we got to wake up or watch out before it's too late. So what do we do if we find ourselves drifting? If any of those things sounded familiar, what can we do? What's the remedy? Well, the remedy is pretty simple. The Apostle told us already, pay close attention to the things that you've heard. Go back to the things that helped draw you to Christ in the beginning and keep on doing those things. My dad gave me a stool one day. 
What's this missing, Rohan? This is a stool. What does it need? Legs. Oh yeah, legs. Thanks, Blaine. So it needs legs. This is a milking stool. It's a small one. <laughs> That's right. How many legs does a milking stool have? Three. That's right. Is that what you're going to say? Okay. Sorry, I didn't call on you. <laughs> they didn't raise their hands. <laughs> Good for you. Okay. <laughs> I'm glad you raised your hand. I wasn't making fun of you. So, three legs. You know, a milking stool doesn't rock because it has three legs, right? Have any of you milked a cow, by the way? Okay. That's a lot of you guys. I've never, I've never milked a cow that's real. Milked a fake cow once. Uh, I could. I could have worked at the dairy at Andrews, but it wasn't, wasn't for me. I'm open to milking a cow, by the way. I'm not afraid. <laughs> so I, I was at this thing, and there was this fake cow in this barnyard. It was a historical village. And there were these little grade schoolers there. I was on a historical tour. And I went to go milk the fake cow. And the kid said, it's broken. And I just made a, a silly pun. And I said, oh, that's utterly disappointing. <laughs> and I didn't think the kid would get it. And he looked at me and he said, seriously, a pun? <laughs> Anyhow, I, I thought it was really funny because I didn't even think he knew what puns were. But anyways, the milking stool, right? It has three legs. And somewhere here I've got three legs. On this first leg, it says something. Rhea, what does this say? Praying. It says praying. Very good. This is one of the legs of the Christian life. If you want to be solid and stable as a Christian, you need to spend time in prayer. But we're missing a couple of legs, right? Yeah, so we've got another one. Save that one for last. Put them, put them in different places. What's this one say? I can't read. Study. St that says studying. That's right. Studying. Spending time in the Word. Studying the Word. So important. But we still are missing one thing, right? If you want to be, be sure that you. Good memory. <laughs> we need one last thing, Blaine. What do we need? Sharing. Sharing. Sharing our faith. Praying, reading, and sharing. A lot of us are pretty good at the reading and the praying, but we're not so good at the sharing. If you want to grow as a Christian and not drift, you have to be sharing your faith. And it comes in so many different ways. It comes through giving out the glow. It comes through talking to people about your faith. It comes by praying for other people. Praying for opportunities. By attending the event tomorrow and being nice to the visitors. By helping out. By dressing up in, in the journey, through, journey to the cross. There are so many ways to share our faith. But if you're not sharing your faith, you're going to be drifting. If you're not spending time in the Word, you're going to be drifting. If you're not reading your Bible, not spending time praying, you're going to find yourself drifting. So the Apostle reminds us, lest you drift away, do these things. Pay attention to what you've heard and your life will be on a solid, stable foundation. You know, the book of Hebrews, it seems like this theme of drifting comes up multiple times. Real quickly before we close out, let's go back to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 7. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you will hear His voice, verse 8, Do not harden your hearts as in the day of rebellion. When you hear the Holy Spirit speaking to you, do it, follow it, obey it. Verse 6, before that says, But Christ, as a son of His own house, 
whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence and rejoicing in, of the hope, firm to the end, hang on, don't drift, be like Jesus. Stay with it. Don't procrastinate spiritually. If God speaks to you today, follow it today to keep from drifting. What about Hebrews chapter 10? Go to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23. What else do the, does the apostle have for us? Hebrews 10, verse 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us, verse 24, consider one another in order to stir up each other to good works. Spur each other on to do good things. Hey, I dare you to go witness to that person. Right? Hey, I dare you to go be nice to that person. Verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. I'm glad that you're here today because you today didn't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Amen. I wish we had this many people here for Sabbath school in the morning. Amen. 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 Or for prayer meeting. Yeah, I know it's dark and not everyone drives at night, but a lot more of us could be there. Or for the other studies that are going on at different parts. Or if there's not something for you, make something. Create your own small group and we'll host it here in the morning, in the daytime. Don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. If you do, you're going to start drifting. You're going to start drifting little by little. Hebrews chapter 12 now. Hebrews 12, verse 1, Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. If there's stuff holding you down, let go of it. I just got back in the pool this week. I hadn't swam in a long time. When you swim in the pool, you don't want to wear a sweater. You don't want to wear overalls in the pool. You don't want to wear a backpack, Rohan, right? Why? You can't swim. You'll drown. It'll hold you down. You want to be efficient in the water. And as Christians, there are some things in life that it's just not worth holding on to. It's just going to slow you down. Let go of it and move forward. Verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Jesus had to endure and hold on also despising the shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. You know, five times in this chapter, we won't look at it for sake of time, but five times in this chapter, the word endure is used. You've got to hang in there. Keep doing what brought you to Jesus in the first place. Spending time in the Word, spending time in prayer, spending time with God's people, and spending time sharing what you've learned. And if you're struggling with drifting, tell that to somebody. That in itself will help you. If you have struggles and doubts, doubts don't bother me. Questions don't bother me. I'm not offended when someone has a good question. Ask your questions. Find somebody. Talk to me about your questions. Don't hold them on all to your lonesome. We think we're the only one with this question or the only one with this issue. But that's not the case. If truth were to be told, so many of us would have the same question or the same issue. The Apostle says, pay attention to what you've been taught, lest you drift away. Wake up and call out. Call out to our Lord and call out to friends in the church and ask for help. Back at Priest Lake several years ago, this time I, I'm alive. It's, it's in my lifetime. We saw a storm coming, and so we pulled the jet skis way up onto the beach. And as we were trying to get the boat better situated, the waves were crashing over the back of the boat, and the boat's starting to get swamped. And so my dad said, we've got to take it over to the lee side of the island, the lee shore, the side that doesn't have the wind and the waves, sheltered cove. And so he gets in the boat, and he's starting to drive and the waves are big and as he's starting around the rocky point on the island the boat dies he tries to start it it doesn't work 
engine apparently is flooded or something has gone wrong. So my aunt, realizing the, the situation that the boat, grandma's boat, is about to be smashed, she, she says, let's get out on the jet ski. So several of us have to slide it down the beach because we pulled it up so high. She hops on and starts going fast across the tops of the waves. And she gets to the boat. I think she even spills in the water, gets back on the jet ski because it's so turbulent in the water. She hands my dad, who by this time had a little paddle, a little measly paddle, and he's trying to paddle away from the rocks. But she hands him a rope, and she starts to tow him away from the rocks. And eventually, she tows him to the shelter of a cove. And he didn't drift in, and the boat was not lost. You know, in times like these, if we find ourselves drifting, the good news is there's a Savior who can rescue us. And if anything that I've said today has struck a chord in your heart, number one, as we pray here, tell Jesus, I want to stop drifting today. And then find somebody to talk to and say, I need prayer and encouragement to just get back on the path so that I won't be drifting either. And finally, find somebody else just to reach out to and let them know that you're praying for them. And ask them if there's anything that you can pray for them for. So let's bow our heads and pray. Dear God, it's so easy to just kind of go into neutral in our faith life. But that's not what you've called us to do. And it's so dangerous to do that. I pray, Lord, today all of us will have a desire right now to say, Jesus, please put my faith back in gear. Take me out of this drifting stage. Lord, pull me away from the rocks. Pull me back to you. If there are practical things, habits we need to develop in devotions or in prayer or in, or in attending meetings or um, getting together with believers, Lord, help us to know that. Show us your will. And thank you so much that for the joy that was set before you, you endured the cross because you knew that we could be saved through it. So Lord, again, we say, yes, Jesus, we accept what you've done. And we accept your help today to help us to, to, start, to stop drifting and to start... Um, pursuing you and your course actively this day. This is our prayer, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a happy Sabbath, and God bless you.